Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this Cornish Story Cafe from Cornwall Heritage Trust. Um, it's wonderful to see so many of you here this evening. So thank you ever so much, especially with the weather outside. It's a bit of a, um, a, bit of a jaunt, really, isn't it, in that weather? Um, we're going to start with a little bit of housekeeping. Um, in the event of a fire alarm sounding, the fire exits are clearly marked. There's one over there and one at the rear of the room as well. Um, if you could follow directions from CHT staff, that's if you can keep up with them when they run. So um, <laughs> um, toilets are also at the rear of the, the room, back there just on my left, so probably your right. Um, Story cafes are a wonderful opportunity to hear a talk, but also to get involved by asking questions or perhaps even giving some examples from your own experience or research. There will be time to do this at the end, and we really do encourage you to get involved and participate, So, um, but it's not mandatory. I promise nobody's going to make you. Um, if you have ever asked yourself, what have the Romans ever done for Roach, then tonight is your lucky night because our speaker this evening, Sean Taylor, will hopefully be able to provide you with some of the answers. Sean has been a professional archaeologist for 24 years, the last 22 of them with Cornwall Archaeological Unit, where he's now senior archaeologist and thus very well qualified for the discussion this evening. CAU were working on the new link road bypassing Roach and it seems that they found out that the Romans did a little bit more from, for Roach than was first expected. I'm not going to spoil the surprise though, so I'll hand over to Sean who will tell us all more um, and please give him a very warm welcome. Thank you very much. Um, I'm probably going to have to sit down for this because of all the mouse clicking. Um, so I hope you don't mind. <coughs> um, yeah, and thank, thank you very much for coming out on such a miserable night. Um, I presume most of you come for the pasties, but uh, we'll just try and get through this as quickly as possible and get on to them. Um, so there's, there's the old, uh, there's the title, and um, that's me, so I work for, and that's the month for no apparent reason. So, I don't know. No, it's got a green. It's got a green light on. Oh, it's, 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 it sounds a bit loud. Is that too loud? Okay. It's me too. Um. Okay, so uh, just a bit of background about the scheme, uh, which I presume, I don't know where you all come from actually, or you could come from anywhere in Cornwall, couldn't you? Um, but uh, this is quite a big scheme for Mid Cornwall. Um, it's been a long time coming. I mean, I'm not, you know, we're not big fans of roads, are we? But uh, some roads really do need to be built, and uh, this is one of them. This is just the blurb from the, uh, from the contractor. Um, I'm sure, you know, if you're really interested, you can find out more about it by going online. Um, basically, we got the fund. Well, the road got the funding in in summer, but we actually started um, on site uh, before that, six months before that, and uh, we're on site for about uh, nine months in total. Just only just finished now. Um, so the history of the road um, scheme um, started for us in 2016 when there were two choices of routes: uh, one to the west of Roach and one to the east of Bugle. Um, and I did an assessment of, of each one, looking at all the archaeological sites, looking at all the historical mapping, um, etc., etc. And uh, then they moved on to their chosen route, which was Roach, in 2018. And we commissioned a geophysical survey. Uh, not the whole route, because half of it lies in clay works, and uh, there's a bit of heathland down the bottom as well, uh, which didn't get surveyed. But uh, all the farmland, um, you know, you can't see the detail, obviously, in this, um, but... Um, all this area was um, the subject of a geophysical survey. And uh, one thing really stood out on that geophysical survey, and that was this big, um, large part of a large enclosure, which is in red on this, which is, uh, you know, this, uh, this line here. Um, and this is just to the west of Trurank Farm, um, on the western edge of Roach. Uh, the farm itself is, um, is, is this bit here. Um, so uh, the, the uh, thing that really sort of 
piqued my interest was the uh, was the rounded corners on this enclosure uh, and 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 the size of it as well. And um, this is uh, characteristic of a, of a Roman fort or, or temporary camp. Um, and um, yeah, I mean it's it's pretty large. It's uh, so this this the length of this arm here is uh, two hundred seventy meters. I'm not going to convert every uh, dimension into into imperial, but um, and now Jacob's gone. Uh, well, I don't have to, do I? Um, but um, I will convert the hectareage into acres. So it, if if it was square, it would enclose a total of seven point three hectares, which is eighteen acres, uh, which is quite quite big. Um, and uh, on another part of the site, uh, a bit more of the geophysical survey here. Um, this, this has also piqued my interest. There's a, there's a, a lot of circular ring ditches here. Um, obviously, at this stage, it's impossible to tell what they are, um, but they're characteristic of, um, yeah, they, they could be Bronze Age barrows, um, or they could be ditched roundhouses, which would normally be of Iron Age or, or Roman date, um, possibly a little later. Um, so, uh, following on from that, the scheme got permission, and um, we were then commissioned to do a load of evaluation trenches over these geophysical anomalies, so from the top end of the scheme to, to the bottom, um, just to find out, uh, just to test what they were. Um, and obviously our focus was on the Roman ditch, or oh, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself, what we thought was the Roman ditch, um, and that, um, that gave us a very characteristic um, shape there with a with a very vertical slot in the base of the ditch very characteristic of a roman uh, military feature not particularly big um that's only about uh, half a meter deep um but um it's it's a typical roman form and uh, because of the size because it wasn't that big we sort of, sort of ruled out that uh, it was going to be a fort um, but it's very typical um, of a temporary camp and uh, I couldn't get the picture, but um, I did see uh, there was a nice picture of a, a camp in Germany. Um, it had exactly the same profile, exactly the same dimensions, um, and uh, it's uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's throughout the Roman Empire. These these ditches are very very similar. So the trench in at Trezes, which is the, uh, the the circular ring ditch um, um, area. Most of these ditches were much shallower, um, nowhere near as steep as the, as the Roman camp ditch. Uh, but also there were very few um, features within the ring ditches, so it's really hard to, to sort of uh, still get, get a handle on what they actually were, what date they were, what function they, they performed. Um, so really we're no more um, no better informed at the end of the evaluation on that particular part of the scheme than we were at the start. We did have a couple of... Um, larger ditches, uh, a couple of parallel ditches on, on one, one geophysical anomaly. And um, there was nothing, though, to suggest it might be anything other than native, um, probably Iron Age or Roman um, enclosure. So following on from the evaluation, we moved to the excavation phase of the job, and that, that started in um, December 2021. Um, and our very own Carl Thorpe here at the front um, monitored the uh, the machine stripping uh, uh, tree rank. Um, so the, we started off with the Roman camp area, um, and uh, we started excavation in February. Um, and this this um, photo shows uh, the full width of the camp. So the uh, ditch is coming down here, and then coming. Along. Just checking you can see that. Um, just coming along here. And going into this field, um, we didn't do this corner because it was outside the road corridor. And then it's returning back up the field up here. So we expected the Roman camp. Um, and um, we got virtually all of it. And again, when we start the excavation, it confirmed what we already knew from the evaluation. We had the same profile along most of it. Um, so it's very deep ankle breaker slot in the uh, in the middle of the ditch. Um, not everywhere. The, uh, the, the, the this was mostly in the northern uh, north north and northwestern parts of the ditch. In the in the south, um, the the stonier geology um, 
just prevented deep ditches from being dug and um, much shallower, less well defined. Um, but really, that doesn't that doesn't uh, alter the fact. Uh, it wouldn't have made any difference to the actual ramparts of the camp. So the material from the ditch would have been dug out to, to form ramparts. Um, if you can't dig out enough material to form a rampart, what the Romans did was just dig a load of turf up from uh, the surrounding fields and use that to build their banks. And that's presumably what happened here. And then, of course, um, every Roman soldier carried a stake, uh, which they then, then used to make a palisade on top of the bank. So quite a formidable de defence um, was the final sort of result. Um, unfortunately, um, and, and you know, this is part of the, goes with the territory really. A, a marching camp is only there for a few days. Um, we didn't find a lot um, associated with it. We didn't find many features. We didn't find many finds. Um, this is one feature that we could associate with the uh, with the ditch because part of the bank was was laid over the top of it. So it's. Um, it's quite typical, certainly within Roman forts, um, for ovens to be set up against the inner rampart um, uh, for shelter and also to keep it away from the, the barracks and the tents. Um, so, um, yeah, this is, a, this is an, a, an oven for baking bread. It's very similar in form to... Um, we get corn dryers down here, um, and all over the country, in fact. Um, double chamber, sort of shallow pit... Um, for, for drying the corn and then a deeper pit for the, for the, um, for the fire that, uh, that dries it. And these ovens are pretty much the same sort of form, just a bit shallower, and, uh, and for baking bread rather than drying grain. Um, and we had another one um, just outside the camp. And, and then, again, this is a, 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 it's typical to have um, ovens outside the camp as well as inside. The space was at a premium within the camp. Um, and... Uh, and it just gets it out of the way, really. Um, but again, it's, it's you know, in terms of archaeology, there's no link stratigraphically between these features and, and the camp. So it's it's you know, without specific dating evidence, it's very hard to tie it into to to the camp. Uh, we did have one entrance uh, within the road scheme to the camp, uh, which was a western entrance. There's a gap about ten meters wide. So um, this is this is one terminal of the ditch, and there's the other one. It's 10 metres between the two. Um, we did seem to have some sort of entrance arrangement with a ditch curving round, and uh, I know I was I was uh, jumped the gun a bit on this and called it a, um, a clavicular entrance, uh, which would be uh, what a typical one would have a, was a, would have a curving ditch running from each each terminal to form some sort of barrier um, protect the, the the gateway. Um, actually, uh, a clavicular would have been inverted the other way. Um, so I've got, got that a bit wrong on site um, and in fact when we stripped this hedge out we found that the uh, feature curved round here was a completely separate feature and had Bronze Age pottery in it which just goes to show that you shouldn't jump to conclusions and uh, this is, a, this is a, just a diagram of the different forms of entrances so you can see actually the, 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 the ditch should have arced around that way and not, uh, and not this way um, it's just an example here of uh, something we're going to come to in a bit, which is a titular defence um, with a ditch running across the entrance. Um, so luckily we know some, uh, some very talented uh, amateur geophysicists um, who uh, got permission from the farmer to extend the geophysical survey and to, uh, to survey in the fields to the um, east of, of the known camp. And uh, they found the, the uh, northeastern return, <coughs> um, and that uh, you can see that uh, extends the size of the camp quite considerably. Um, it gives us a classic playing card shape for the for the camp, which is a typical Roman uh, feature, um, and uh, and a, a length for the longest arm of the camp of 100, 420 meters which is almost double the length of the, the western arm. And uh, it gives us a revised total of 11.3 um, hectares, 28 acres for the site, which is easily enough to uh, hold around uh, um, one whole Roman legion, plus all the hangers-on, um, auxiliaries, um, camp followers, which, uh, you know, um, altogether probably about 10,000 people would fit inside that. 
And that's just that's just a typical uh, layout from uh, that's that's um, that's come from a classical writer, not the diagram, but the uh, you know that's been interpreted from a classical writer hygienist um, as, to, as to what a, a, a camp might be laid out like. And that one's actually um, that's a, that's a camp big enough for forty thousand people, so it's yeah, four times the size. So as I, I think I mentioned earlier, very few fines um, associated with the camp. And like I said, it was not surprising. There are only, you know, a temporary camp could have been there for a couple of days, could have been there for a couple of weeks, but probably not much longer than that. Um, we did find this shared a possible saving ware from, uh, this came from over the oven that was built against the bank. Uh, another cautionary tale here. Um, we got really excited about this uh, small lead weight um, which we thought was part of a, a Roman surveying kit, a grober. Um, and uh, this bit would have been a plumb bob, sort of underneath, dangling down to keep everything level. And uh, um, until it got to the more detailed finds assessment, which identified as a 19th century draw knob. <laughs> <coughs> Sad face. Um, there. So um, the, the Roman cut wasn't the only thing we, we found in this area at Tarank. Um, everything else was completely unexpected, uh, didn't appear on the geophysical survey at all, um, and, and nor, nor should it. There's no way these post holes would have shown up on any geophysical survey. Um, so they included, uh, there's a group of pits at the top that had Neolithic pottery in, um, a possible Bronze Age roundhouse with these stake holes, um, and a group of other features I'll get to in a minute. Um, so these Neolithic pits, uh, yeah, very close to the roundhouse. Um, and uh, this produced um, grooveware, from, which is from the late Neolithic period. Um, and these sort of pits are quite typical. We've done quite a lot of them in the last few years of uh, Neolithic pits with loads of nice pottery, flint, nice stone tools in them. Um, but at the time, I sort of assumed they were separate from the roundhouse. Um, and just coincidentally happened to be in the area. Um, and we did get some different pottery styles associated with these post holes. Um, we're not sure what this is, but uh, it's variously been described as Travisca, which is Bronze Age, or possibly Beaker, which I don't think it is, but uh, which will be slightly earlier. Um, but these pieces definitely are grooveware, which is Neolithic, and some of these have come from these post holes, which I think is quite exciting because um, it would probably be the earliest, uh, one of the earliest um, roundhouses in Cornwall. Um, we, don't, we just simply don't have any Neolithic roundhouses, I don't think. Um, so, um, yeah, if it's Bronze Age, it's still exciting because it's a different form from what we usually expect. Um, generally, a Bronze Age roundhouse would be in a sunken hollow with big post holes, you know, with sort of uh, six or eight post holes in a ring um, to support the roof. This is something different, and uh, until we get some sort of um, closure on the finds and a, a few radiocarbon dates. I don't think we're going to completely get on top of this. So we also found features that postdated the uh, the camp ditch, and here's a grave cut across the ditch after it had filled up. Um, uh, the only surviving remains of which were um, hobnails from one end of the grave, which would have been uh, would have been uh, uh, form, from a boot or boots um, um, on the on the buried individual. Um, this is pretty common for mid Cornwall is to find absolutely nothing in a grave, uh, certainly no bones because of the, the, the acidity of the soils. Um, we've dug one in the last 20 years at um, Scarce Water over near St Stephen's um, and that had a, just a stain of a body in the bottom of it along with hobnails and a, and a, and a brooch uh, that would have um, uh, fastened a shawl or shroud around the body. Um, but it, yeah, it makes, just makes life a bit more difficult for the archaeologists not to find any bones. Um, and uh, I'm sure there's plenty of other pits that have been dug in the last 20 or 30 years that um, have gone unrecognised as graves purely because there's nothing left in them. Um, and yeah, it's very, very common in the Roman period to bury people with their boots on for the journey to the afterlife. Um, so the burial can't be, from the, can't, uh, be contemporary with the camp. Um, the ditch had filled up by the time it was cut into it. Um, so it may have been um, from a time when the bank was visible, um, or it may have been um, dug as, uh, immediately after the ditch had been 
deliberately backfilled, although um, I don't think the ditch was deliberately backfilled. Uh, it seems to have silted up gradually over, over a fairly prolonged period. And now, just outside the camp, to the west of it, um, were some really interesting features. Um, so there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a enclosure ditch here, comes round here, and then it carries on up here and crosses the Roman camp ditch, which is running from left to right. Um, there's another one here and another one there. Um, and uh, one of them, yes, had this ditch running off that cut through the camp ditch and, and therefore post-dated it. Um, and uh, one section of the ditch had a, had a section of stone in it, <coughs> this patch here, that looked like it was a wall. So all of these may have been put in trenches for walls that have subsequently been robbed for, for building stone. Um, and the finds for this were, were really quite nice. Um, so we've got um, bits of um, um, imported um, amphora and uh, pottery vessels from the Mediterranean. Um, and there was quite a lot of this. Um, and uh, I mean, it's really unusual for an inland site in Cornwall to have such a rich assemblage of post-Roman finds. Um, it's exactly the same sort of material that, that's found at Tintagel. And uh, it, it's presumably indicating trade with a, with a centre like Tintagel. Um, um, and yeah, I mean, yeah, it's just a fantastic sort of thing to find in uh, just outside uh, Roach. So moving on to the other, the other site, the ring ditches, about half a mile to the southeast of Trirank. Um, that's what we could see on the geoph geophysical survey. Um, so you've got all these ring ditches and then you've got bits of old field system ditches as well. Um, and that's what we found when we actually excavated the site. Um, so there's about double the amount of ring ditches, um, quite a bit more field system. Um, and some very nice features, including this, um, this is our earliest feature that we found on the site, which is an early Neolithic longhouse. Um, so it's only the second name from Cornwall. This is really significant. This is nationally significant, this, this site. Um, if we hadn't had the Roman camp, this would have been the, the, you know, the icing on the cake, really. Um, I'd have been talking about this instead of the Roman stuff. Um, so it's probably about uh, 3,800 BC. Um, and, um, yeah, the other one was, um, was from uh, Penhale, just around the corner, over the hill. <coughs> um, so uh, it took the form of two parallel lines of posts. So you can see these lines of posts there and there. Um, these were set in a trench, some sort of foundation trench, um, and then there was just, a, just the trench across the top and it was completely open to the, uh, to the bottom there. Uh, and then there's some central pits, one of which was definitely a hearth, I think there were two hearths um, and another pit, and then there was also a line of parallel pits um, over here, just three of them. And uh, it's, it's a very small example, although there are others as, as small as this. Most of them are, you know, 20 metres long or so, or up to 40 metres long, and, uh, but most of them are of similar width. So it, it seems like it probably was this size. We, couldn't, we, we had a good hunt down here to, 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 to chase the, you know, to see whether it was going any further that way. Absolutely nothing. So I think this is the, uh, this is the full extent of it. And there's some lovely finds from here. So there's a polished flint axe here. Um, that's from one of the pits, uh, one of the three pits off to the left of the previous photo. Uh, a pretty rare find from a sealed archaeological context. Uh, quite a few of them turn up from field walking. I say quite a few, not that many, but uh, you know, more from field walking than anything else. Um, it's the first one I've uh, found in a, on an archaeological site. It would have taken a huge amount of effort to polish it. Um, flint, obviously, very hard. Um, and then not only has it been lovingly made, it's been then damaged um, um, by having loads of flakes removed from it, not loads, sorry, a couple of flakes removed from it before it was buried in the pit. And I, I don't think this, I, I doubt very much this was because they were running short of flint. I think it was being deliberately decommissioned. Um, and it is indeed a beautiful object. And I think the finder actually was uh, is sat at the back of the room. Um, there she is, yes. 
And, uh, and also from, uh, from, the, from the Longhouse, we had this lovely pottery. I mean, I just looked at that and thought that's Roman, isn't it? And uh, luckily we had Carl Thorpe on site um, to tell us otherwise. Um, it's very well. I mean, I found early Neolithic, Neolithic pottery before, and it's absolutely shabby stuff. Um, but this was uh, really well fired, really well made. And, uh, and most definitely early Neolithic. Um, so just uh, just outside the uh, longhouse, the longhouse is up here. Um, we had another ring ditch here, um, and uh, very few finds from most of these these other ring ditches that I've shown you earlier. And we'll go on to show you some more in a minute. Um, so because of the lack of finds, we didn't know if they represented barrows, roundhouses, or something else. This one, although it was really scrappy and uh, very truncated, there was you know this is the ditch of it here. Couldn't find it at all over here. I don't think there's a slot there. I'm just looking for it, but I uh, don't know if we found it there. Um, so a very scrappy feature, um, but it did contain um, some very interesting pottery. Um, so this is Middle Neolithic Peterborough Ware, 3400 to 3000 BC. Um, this was un unknown in Cornwall until about uh, tw 15 years ago. Uh, some was found on a site in Helston. And then we found some, we found quite a bit on a site just outside Truro on the site of the uh, park and ride there, the Waitrose. Um, and there's been a couple of other finds, I think, since then. We've had some on the A30, and I can't remember where the fourth site was. But anyway, just to, just to emphasise that it is a very rare find in, in, in Cornwall. Um, uh, but it wasn't the only thing on this, uh, buried in the pit on the circuit of this ring ditch. Uh, we also had... Um, a pit containing a human cremation and again this is um, this is pretty well extremely rare in, in nationally let alone in Cornwall um, to find a middle Neolithic cremation um, the trouble was we couldn't really link it um, link the Peter of Ware to the to the cremation they came from two different pits um, and um, and it's really something I haven't come across before until I heard about a site in Devon. Um, so um, the, this, um, the, site, the site in Devon um, was published about five years ago, and that again was a was a ring ditch, much better um, preserved ring ditch in this case, but again had Peter Brewer and a cremation with it. So um, they decided that that must be a Neolithic round barrow, and they trumpeted the fact that it was. Um, the furthest west ever found. I mean, they're not particularly common nationally, uh, let alone in Devon, and, uh, and we've just trumped them if we, <laughs> by finding an even further west one. <clears throat> it's, not all, it's not all competitive in archaeology, I promise you. Yes, Um, we also had another couple of um, we had some hole pots that we found in pits up near the up near the road, uh, the existing road, um, and I think um, we weren't really sure whether these were Neolithic or Bronze Age because uh, basically we had to block lift them pretty much whole to preserve them. Um, there was some cremated bone in one of the pits, but um, we don't know if the pots contain bone yet. So they've been um, block lifted whole. They've taken off to the conservator who will um, excavate them under laboratory conditions. Um, so here's uh, one of the other ring ditches, and one of the only ones, if not the, I think it was the only one that contained a post ring within it, which enables us to sort of possibly interpret it as a, as a, as a roundhouse, um, surrounded by a, a ring ditch, which would have been there for, um, well, just to enclose the space, really. I was just, that's, Sometimes they're called drip gullies, or you know, people think they're for drainage, but I think that that's probably not the case. Um, they're just really um, enclosing a space and, and dividing the inside from the outside. Uh, very few finds, uh, no hearth, um, so maybe it was a barrow. You know, we do, we do, we do get barrows with post rings beneath them, um, earlier structures before they were sealed up. Um, but in this instance, uh, we did recover some Iron Age. Uh, or Roman pottery from, or Roman and British rather, pottery from, um, from uh, I think it was the section of the ring ditch, maybe from one post hole as well. So this is probably, in ba on balance, a, a roundhouse. Um, and we had, a, we had a bit of a snow shower on April the 1st, I think it was. 
um, which really showed up um, briefly. I mean, the, the snow was only lying for about half an hour, I think. Um, but uh, we, had, we had a drone pilot on site who got his uh, drone up, and uh, there we go. I don't, I don't know how clearly... Yes, you can see them quite clearly, can't you? There's, uh, there's one there, um, and a partial one there, and, and this. Uh, none of these we noticed on the ground at all until, until this drone shot. Um, and I think there was... I, th I think we'd seen that one, but there was another one over, over here somewhere. Maybe I'm thinking of that one. Um, so that was, that was a really useful uh, shower of snow. Um, and we had another ring ditch um, further down the hill um, um, and with a post ring within it, uh, lots of finds from it. Uh, so we can definitely identify this one as Iron Age or Early Roman um, and its function as a house. Um, and we had some uh, native cordon ware, imported burnished ware and um, also this shirt of... Uh, of Roman amphora, which is uh, an early form, uh, I think first century BC to first century AD. And th this was attached, or situated rather, next to a, a large rectangular enclosure. Um, it's about 25 metres from side to side. Um, and this had been built in two phases. Um, so there's an original shallow ditch, which is this one you can see there, comes across there and then it sort of disappears into the larger ditch over there. Um, this was replaced by this this outside ditch running around there um, and this had an ankle breaker slot in the base which sort of alerted us to the fact that it might be uh, non-native um, and, and the rounded corners also sort of helped to, to bring that into focus. Um, and we thought well maybe it might be a Roman fortlet which is um, sort of very few have been excavated. Um, there's, there's a variety of functions assigned to them. Um, we've got signal stations on the coast, one of which in Devon was excavated, and um, uh, it was probably about the same size as this. Um, there's a couple in Cornwall that have been partially excavated by, the, by uh, Malcolm and, and Mark, the people who did the geophysical survey for us. And again, they got, uh, I think, Roman um, fine assemblages from them. But uh, they, they were all on the coast, uh, and they're all assumed to be signal stations. This one's well inland. It's well below the crest of the hill. So uh, no, no internal features whatsoever. Um, very unlikely to be a signal station. Um, and the later ditch had this... Um, so the, the, the inner ditch had been backfilled in this area um, to make an entrance. Um, and in front of this entrance was, uh, was a trench, um, which we assumed, uh, if you remember the slide I showed you earlier with the uh, various different Roman defences, um, we assumed this was a titular, or a, a titulus rather. Um, when we excavated it, um, we found um, it had been used as a burial, uh, to, to, sorry, to bury someone. Um, it was in fact, um, it's about 2.8 metres long, so way longer than it needed to be as a grave, which is why we're still hold, holding on to the titulus interpretation, but it may well have been um, used to bury someone as, as the fort that was decommissioned um, when it was abandoned or, 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 or shortly after, afterwards. So it's a bit scrappy. The geology here was absolutely horrible. These stones are really loose. That's natural geology. Kept collapsing in. Um, it's, it, was, it was probably, I mean, I didn't dig it, but it was probably um, I, I was packed the excavators at the back of the room as well, um, next to the finder of the polished axe. And uh, perhaps you'd address any questions on how difficult it was to dig to them at the end. Um, but what you can just about maybe see in this picture is um, there was a whole pot that was smashed, uh, and not by the excavator, I hasten to add. Um, it was smashed um, <coughs> when the grave was backfilled. Um, there's a bit of tibia there, um, and there was also a tooth um, up this end somewhere, and um, a uh, bronze pin, and, and then back down this end, uh, these are, I don't know if you can just about see this sort of rusty patch here, these were um, groups of hobnails representing the boots. Um, and then when... Um, 
when the hedge hedgerows were removed, we got the other return. Um, so we could see it was a square feature uh, with rounded corners. We could also see that this roundhouse uh, respects the first um, original phase of the ditch, um, but is then cut by the, uh, the later phase of the ditch. Um, and we could also see that the roundhouse didn't come into this area which again emphasizes the fact that it's respecting the, the original ditch. So it's, it's built as some sort of annex to the original enclosure. And the other thing of interest on this uh, slide is this, um, well, there's this ditch here, which also contains some uh, later Roman amphora. Um, it may be a defensive feature. Um, in the manner of the clavicular that I mentioned earlier, um, or it may be a completely separate feature. And we've also got this uh, double parallel line of uh, ditches here, um, and this was a probably a trackway, a ditch trackway, um, which I think was contemporary with the first phase of the um, fortlet, um, but cut by the second phase. And in fact, this um, this feature here carries on right up to the main road, which is a distance about uh, 300 metres, I think, um, out on the geophysical survey. So it's, uh, it's quite a large, large feature. <coughs> so I don't think I really mentioned the position of the, the, the temporary camp, um, but it's quite similar to the fortlet. Um, so we're overlooking the headwaters of the Fowl, the fact this is the Fowl running down here. And then this is Goss Moor, obviously, um, that the fowl runs into. So it's, um, it's quite a physical barrier there. Um, and just over this side, you've got, uh, you've got Hensbarrow Downs uh, rising up. And then over the other side, you've got the sort of hill that Belauda and Catalan Dines are on. Or Ridge, rather. Um, so I, I think it may have commanded the southern uh, route around Goss Moor. Um, or it's... Um, it may have provided a safe haven to store taxes um, and or tin. Um, so I think, you know, it, it, it's, is it a strategic um, site for uh, um, defending, a, you know, or guarding the route around Gosmoor? Or is it there for sort of more uh, sort of administrative purposes, sort of collected with the tin trade? And uh, we did find this piece of mould. It's not a piece of mould, it's a piece of a mould. <laughs> Um, in the Fortlet Ditch, um, it's, it's, it's similar to other uh, more complete, I think, um, moulds that have been found elsewhere. Um, and it's used to cold hammer pewter into a bowl. I think um, the whole mould would have, is it four holes in the base that the pewter's hammered through to form legs? Is no, that right, Carl? The, the <coughs> curve you see there is for a foot ring, which goes round. So it doesn't have legs, it has. Oh, I see. Yes, so yes. All right. Yeah. On the base of the. Yeah. <coughs> so, is this is this evidence of the of the tin, you know, being used in the in very much in the local vicinity to make these um, pewter plates um, for export? Um, is it just coincidence, or or you know, hopefully we'll find out by um, you know the full program of analysis that will follow on from this field work. I should sort of point out that it's a very early stages of, you know, I'm giving this talk now, you know, after all the analysis uh, that goes on over the next few years, I could, uh, you know, look really stupid, especially as we're being filmed. Um, <coughs> I hope that doesn't come back to bite me, you know, in a few years' time. So I'm just going to have a little discussion now about the wider picture in Cornwall. Um, so we've had quite a few... Um, identification of potential sites and, and also, as I think I just mentioned, um, excavated sites um, of fortlets and signal stations over the last few years. So um, there's been quite a bit of work. Um, yeah, a lot, a lot of them are very similar, similar size to ours. Um, there's been quite a lot of work using LIDAR, um, which um, shows up very subtle variations in, in um, height. Um, so it picks up earthwork banks that haven't been spotted from aerial pho photography and I think in this case um, that might be in a wooded area which is why this one was never spotted before from earthworks, uh, from, from aeroplanes, sorry. Um, 
this one was known about. I'd just like to thank Chris Smart from Exeter University for providing this image. He hasn't given me permission because I didn't get a hold of him, but um, anyway, if he's watching, thank you. Um, I, won't, I won't tell you where it is just, um, just because um, it's his image and not mine. So um, uh, This is one of mine, though. Uh, so this is a geophysical survey from uh, Camelford School. We did the excavations there um, in 2007, I think. 2000, oh, no, 2008. Um, and I have to say, I was really looking forward to excavating this one. Um, I, sort of, I, I got into archaeology from, um, from uh, doing an ancient history A-level with a, with a teacher who'd done a bit of archaeology. And um, I was dying to uh, get into some Roman stuff and sort of one thing and another after college sort of ended up just, you know, on the, on the digging circuit and then ended up at home, you know, back here at home and uh, dying to, you know, come across a Roman site. And this, this looked really good. Um, and unfortunately, it looked so good that the developers decided it was going to cost too much to excavate and they would build up the levels over it and put a car park on top of it so we didn't dig it. But uh, another good candidate. Um, and uh, so that was Fortlet's camps in Cornwall. Um, there's also quite a few uh, identifications of temporary camps over the, over the recent years. So this is... Um, um, there's a lot of uh, different sizes, but they're usually playing card shaped um, with rounded corners. So here's, uh, here's a LiDAR image of one at Velendruckia in Penwith. So if you're surprised the Romans got as far as Roach, um, you're going to be really surprised to learn that they might have got as far as um, uh, St. Creed. Um, so you've got the nice rounded corners there. I mean, it's completely at variance with the surrounding field system, so it's nothing to do with that. Um, and then you've got a bit of, uh, I think this is a bit of quarrying or mining in the, in the corner that sort of um, ruined it. <laughs> um, and uh, I got an aerial shot of that yesterday, hot off the press um, with my drone and the lovely rounded corner there, a um, bit missing there, which was showing up on the LiDAR very nicely. And then I think it's uh, I think it's this one that curves round to and comes back down, and then the rest is hidden under the tree. So you can see that lidar does, really does show you uh, it does get through the trees. So it's a really useful tool. Um, and then another another sort of prospecting method for temporary camps <coughs> has been geophysical surveys, and this is um, this is the Roman fort of Ristormal. Um, so in purple is the fort. Um, there's a variety of enclosures around it, but of interest to, to for the purposes of this talk, this is the interesting bit. This is a temporary camp um, right next to it, and um, it's a lot smaller than our, our camp, which um, I'm assuming to be a marching camp. This is, this is probably, a, uh, I think the best explanation is probably as a construction camp for the, for the, for the fort. So, um, yeah, so as I was just saying, there's various types of temporary camp. There's marching camps for the, for the army on the move, um, the construction camps possibly for, for building forts or other, other major sort of engineering tasks. And you also get training camps. Um, now, the training camps are usually near uh, large legionary fortresses. So you might expect some uh, near Exeter. There's certainly loads in, in Wales around, uh, not far from Chester, um, Caerleon in the south. Um, and uh, so, yeah, Calstock and Restormal. So Calstock's the other Roman fort that's been discovered in recent years. That also has a, a temporary camp um, beneath it, I think. Um, I'm not sure if that's been confirmed by excavation, but it certainly shows up on the geophysical survey. So those, those Calstock and Restormal, two two known forts that have also have construction camps or uh, or at least temporary camps um, next to them or within them. Um, so if I just point out, that's Calstock there, um, that's Restormal. And of course the other known one is, um, the known, known fort is Nand Stalin, I think that's that one. Um, and, uh, but we have got um, another potential camp uh, near Bodmin. Again, that's a, that's a secret and I'm not allowed to tell you exactly where it is. Um, but the uh, so to rank and the, the one at Bodmin are much bigger than these 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 other known camps uh, and they could easily accommodate a legion. Too far from Exeter to be uh, training camps, 
which leads me to believe that um, um, they're actually part of the um, invasion force um, in, in the sort of uh, 50s AD. Um, uh, the Second Augustan Legion, which came right across southwest Britain and, um, and ended up back at Exeter within the legionary fortress um, until about 80, I think, 80 AD, where it was, I think it went off to Gloucester and then Cowent, maybe. <coughs> but perhaps it was led through Cornwall by Vespasian himself. So the future emperor, um, sorry, I might assume you, you know Vespasian is for a start, uh, Roman emperor. Um, he, was the, uh, he was leading the Second Augustan Legion um, during that campaign. I'm sure you all knew that, sorry. Um, so we're likely to get more sites confirmed in the future from LIDAR and the sort of stuff I do, the developer-funded archaeology. Um, what I've got here is a, is a map showing um, potential um, fort sites. Um, so some of these can be forts, none of them can be forts. You know, they're all square enclosures, lots, most of them with rounded corners. Um, you can see there's quite a lot of them. Um, but like I say, we don't know until, until you dig them or do some field walking over them, you just don't know. Um, but I do think uh, we need to rethink some, um, some prevailing attitudes about the Romans in Cornwall. So I did a, I did a Google search. Um, basically, I read a book this year, and I can't remember what it was, um, what, it, what the title was, who wrote it. But it was published in 2013, I remember that bit. Um, it wasn't a reprint, it was, uh, that was the original publication date. And it, in it, it said the Romans didn't come to Cornwall. Um, so I googled, you know, Romans didn't come to Cornwall, um, and I came up with this phrase. I'll read it out. Emperors Claudius and Vespasian conquered Britain after 43 AD, and until 410 AD, much of eastern and southern Britain was under Roman control. However, the Romans never extended control into all of present-day Scotland, and hardly at all into Wales or Cornwall. Now, I'm not really sure what that's... Um, that, what, there's quite a few things wrong with that phrase, I think. Um, and I feel a bit rude um, reproducing that because the first hit that came up wasn't from that book that I mentioned. It was actually on the Cornwall Heritage Trust website. I'm sorry. <laughs> to, <coughs> seems very rude. I probably won't get a pasty now, will I? Um, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm not sure what sort of how much evidence we need to to. Uh, to, to to, to say that the, you know we weren't much different from anywhere else in the country. You know we've got uh, Restore was occupied for three hundred years, um, so, you know, presumably semi permanent, permanent, permanently at least. Um, we've got one villa site in Cornwall. Um, how many villa sites has Devon got? Devon's got one as well. So no one ever sort of claims East Devon was outside of Roman control. Um, so I really, you know, I really do think we need to update. Um, well, the text on your website for start, and uh, but but it's not just it's a general sort of thing. You know, if I can pick up a general book on Roman Britain and it, you know it's published ten years ago, that um, that says the Romans didn't come to Cornwall. Well, you know what we're we doing. The, uh, it, you know, by two thousand and thirteen, the, the the site of Stormall was had been published. A short note had been published. Um, okay, Calstock wasn't discovered and wasn't published until two thousand and fourteen. But Nan Stalin was dug in the sixties and published in nineteen seventy two. So, um, yeah, I don't, I, it's just quite difficult, isn't it, to, um, to, to, to change people's minds once, once something gets in them. Um, and going slightly um, off topic, um, so I think part of, the, part of the problem is we sort of try and make ourselves out to be some, you know, not special, but, you know, different. So we've got uh, different terminology for our enclosures. We call them rounds. Um, they're, they're found in Cornwall and West Devon. And that can sort of, you know, nowhere else has rounds. So we, we, we feel, you know, we're, we're a bit different. But um, it's just an enclosed settlement of, of a circular nature, usually. Um, and um, this, this, this map shows um, excavated sites um, from a 2016 study. So these are all excavated, they've all been dated, um, and it shows enclosed settlements um, only. Now you can see we are a little bit different, look, we've got lots of, uh, the yellow ones are round settlements, enclosures, um, and the uh, red ones are square enclosures, and there's D-shaped enclosures there as well. We've got uh, one in Cornwall, I think. 
Uh, we just expected another one, actually, so we've got at least two in Cornwall. Um, we, we have got square enclosures as well, and you can see a little cluster of round enclosures in Hampshire. I mean, uh, I don't, don't ever hear anyone in Hampshire claiming that they held out against the Romans, um, indomitable sort of Hampshireans um, with a druid and their magic potion um, holding out, you know, not wanting to be civilised, wanting to hold out until the barbaric Saxons came along and saved them from the Romans. So, um, yeah, I mean, it just, um, it's just... I do think a general rethink is needed and a general updating of, uh, of, of, of texts. Um, and uh, that's a different way of displaying the same data, really, just showing you the, um, the just enclosed settlements without regard to what shape they are. Um, what does show is that we've had a lot more excavation in Cornwall than, we are, than, than, than in quite large areas of the country. So I think we've been quite lucky in that respect. And, um, and the same thing goes for unenclosed settlements. Again, we've got, you know, there's, there's just, we can add about three to that list in the last uh, four years since this study's been done. Um, but you get them everywhere. You know, you get enclosed settlements everywhere and you get unenclosed settlements everywhere. And the unenclosed settlements, of course, um, they're only showing up because of the developer-funded archaeology that we do now. Um, they don't leave um, ditches and banks for earthwork surveys and, uh, and crop marks for, 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 for aerial photos to pick up. Um, but they're, they're, they turn out to be almost as, you know, densely um, in, in the landscape as, as the enclosed settlements. So uh, just that, that's it, really. I just wanted to um, um, just, just, you know, I, I really do think it was an important site um, and I think it's going to make quite a big contribution. Um, if you want to check on our analysis of the you know how the how the project progresses in the next few years we'll probably post updates on the on the CAU Facebook page um, do follow it to uh, to find out the news there and there's some of the excavation team um, I can't actually uh, we've got oh, we've got Roger Smith on the end from the from the archaeological society um, Ryan that's uh, I'm not sure who that was, Alex. Can you remember? Chris. Is it Chris? Yeah. So she was volunteering at the time. She's now a paid up member of staff. For some reason, I'm in the photo, even though I didn't do any work on this site at all, physically. Um, uh, Richard, who was running the site, Ian, and... Was that Bobby Joe? So you're not in it either. Neither of you two are in it. And you're not in it. So, yeah, there was about twice as many people working on the site as in that photo, but obviously they were off doing something important, like work or something at the time. Um, so I'd like to thank them, actually. Um, they did a fantastic job under very difficult circumstances. Um, and it was extremely hard work. There's so much more archaeology there than we expected um, when we went in there. <laughs> Mostly Carl's fault for finding it in the first place. Right, so I'm just going to leave this video playing while... Um, if, just, you know, if there are any questions... Excuse my ignorance. So you found all that. Has the road gone through it now? It's in the process of being of going through it now. So when you find something that's of great significance, does that stop a road from going through it? If it had been found before the planning went through, it may have, may have, it may, we could have maybe rerouted the road slightly. Um, around things, but that, that didn't happen in this case. Um, and in general, you know, uh, yeah, we find these things and they'd have to be really significant for, for anything to, to be stopped. Certainly not at the stage that we were at when we started digging them. Do you have to dig faster then? <laughs> <laughs> it must be heart-wrenching to find something so significant and then have, you know, the tarmac coming over you. Well, if we didn't... I mean, it's. I mean, we're arche we're field archaeologists. We love digging things up and and finding out what you know, finding out things that weren't known before. I and mean, that's what we sort of, that's what we do. It, and yeah, I, I, mean, I find it really exciting. So um, it's a shame when things are completely lost. In the case of the camp, you know, we've only <coughs> we've only excavated about a uh, less than a quarter of it, I think, or like a fifth of it. Um, so the rest of it is going to be there for for the next however long.
Um, you've identified there's possibly around 10,000 soldiers in the camp that you found here, or the fort that you found here. And you found other fortlets in Cornwall. How would you gauge the total occupation of Roman soldiers in Cornwall at, say, the peak occupation? Uh, that, that would be impossible to gauge without really closely dating every single one of them. Um, I think the three forts at uh, Calstock, Restormal and Nansalan are all fairly similar in size. They wouldn't be big enough for a legion. I think um, they're probably big enough for maybe a, a tenth of that. About 500 men each. About 500 men each. So um, they were all occupied con con contemporaneously. Um, so there you go. That's 1,500 men at one stage um, over a period of about 20 years. Um, I think the fortlet probably hold a, a century of, of men. I think it's 80, 80 men, um, in, in presumably in tents, as we didn't find any structural um, features at all inside the camp. Um, I, you know, so you can imagine that if 25 metres by 25 metres square can hold 80 men, and there's maybe 20 of these around the country, county. Um, um, you do the maths. <laughs> <laughs> Is that 1,600? Yeah. What's the significance to the damage to the hand axe? It is, was it, is it normal to do that sort of thing, the polished hand axe? I, I don't know a lot about polished flint axes. That's the first one I've seen um, you know, on, a, on a site. Um, but it did look like it had been deliberately sort of you know, here we are. It's quite a common thing, actually, with prehistoric, nice prehistoric stuff, is that, you know, when, they, when it goes out of use, people sort of damage it slightly to, to make sure, I suppose, that it's not, um, no one else can have it. <laughs> this looks like quite an exciting site, although it's, it's not huge. It's a fraction of the size of the site where the new A30 is going. Are you doing a similar exercise there, and are you finding exciting stuff? Um, yes, funny you should ask, actually. When they, they asked me to do this talk, they, they asked for the A30. Um, yeah, yes, we, we are doing the excavations on the A30. Um, uh, but the original site for the talk was Roach, so I thought, well, it makes more sense to talk about Roach mm. for this talk. Mm. And in fact, we are closer to Roach, I think, than Carl and Cross anyway, so... Um, I'm, I'm quite happy with that decision. But yes, um, we've, we've done lots of work on the A30. Uh, we're almost coming to a close now. Um, we found a huge amount of sites. Um, and um, I, I did a talk to the Archaeological Society last February on what we'd found to date um, uh, then. We found a little bit more since then. Uh, and, and presumably I'll be giving a talk on it some other, other time. But yeah, we found, I mean, I could list them. <laughs> uh, we found Mesolithic... Um, flint scatters and settlement um, right through to World War II um, D-Day bases or camps rather. Thank you. Um, did the dry weather of this summer reveal any further sites that you hadn't been aware of previously? Uh, no, the dry weather would have masked anything we found. Oh, right. it, 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 it's, uh, the, the, I mean, it's, it's the contrast between the, the, um, the, the natural and the ditch fills or the feature fills that we see that, 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 that help us identify these things. Uh, when everything's dry, it all goes the same colour. Oh, right. You can't Thank see you. anything. <laughs> So, thank you very much for that. Thank you all for your questions and your, and your comments. They're all brilliant to add to the colour of the evening and clarification as well, because I was wondering too about what would happen if they redirected the road and things like that. So, <coughs> all very interesting. Thank you very much. And thank you, Sean, um, on behalf of everyone here for a really informative talk. Um, I was astonished by the magnitude of the fort. 28 acres, to me, is enormous. It's bigger than our newest site at Care Brand. You know, it's... Uh, but, um, to put it into perspective. So, um, yeah, absolutely fascinating. Thank you. So I think everybody, a round of applause for Sean. Thanks. And hopefully we can get you to come and do another talk on the A30. <laughs> that would be great. Booked in.
Um, this Story Cafe was funded by the National Lottery Community Fund as part of their Jubilee funding. Our next Story Cafe will take place on Thursday the 24th of November at Liscard Public Hall. Um, and it will be on one of the sites that we look after, which is the Hurlers. Um, the talk will be given by Jackie Novakovsky, and tickets will be available from Eventbrite in the next week or so. Um, a top tip being that CHT members do tend to receive first dibs on ticket booking. So if you're dithering about whether to become a member, that might just push you. Um, if you've enjoyed this Story Cafe, and I, I have, I hope all of you have too, um, and you'd like to get involved with CHT um, and maybe help to organise future events just like this one, we are looking for volunteers to help um, and we would really love to hear from you if you're keen to get involved. So you can see any one of the CHT staff and they'll be more than happy to discuss that with you. Um, I believe the pasties have arrived. I can hear bags rustling in the kitchen. Um, these are courtesy of the Jubilee funding. Um, which meant that we're able to provide them free of charge. Oh, look, as if by magic, it's all happening. Um, if you'd like to make a donation to the Trust, there are donation pots by the refreshments table. Um, and we also have our calendars, our Christmas cards, and our memberships for sale at the back as well. Um, we're very grateful for your support. Every little helps our charity to preserve and strengthen Cornwall's heritage. Enjoy your pasty. Have a safe trip home and we look forward to seeing you all at the next Story Cafe. Thank you very much.